everyone. Boyon, bienvenidos a todos. Welcome, everybody, to the first in a very special three-part series on Sephardic Jews and race in the United States with Professor Devin Nahr. I first want to take the moment to introduce myself. My name is Ethan Marcus. I am the Director of Communications for the El La Hermandad Sephardit de America, the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, an over 100-year-old organization dedicated to serving the wider Sephardic Latino-speaking community in the United States and around the world. I'm very proud to be here um, as a part of our new Sephardic Digital Academy initiative, a brand new online initiative through the Sephardic Brotherhood featuring Ladino language and culture classes, Torah insights and classes, rabbinic talks, um, Sephardic cooking classes, history, and a whole lot more. And it's a very, very special program we're very proud of, one new and hopefully that willing to engage the future generation of Sephardic Jews in America and around the world. Tonight, we begin part one of our three part Sephardic Jews and race in the United States series, exploring systemic racism and Sephardic Jewry. I want to take a moment first to thank our general sponsor, the Isaac Al Haddad Foundation, as well as our co sponsors and partners, um, Congregation Or Shalom and the Seattle Sephardic Network, for helping to make sure this talk series was possible. It is now my dear, uh, distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, a man who really needs no introduction in the Sephardic world, but will still be getting one either way, um, and who's also a close friend and a personal mentor to myself, Dr. Professor Devin Nahr. Uh, Professor Nahr, Dr. Nahr, is uh, the Isaac al Haddad Professor in Sephardic Studies, Associate Professor of History, and faculty at the Strom Center for Jewish Studies in the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. As the chair of UW's Sephardic Studies program, Dr. Nahr oversees a robust set of initiatives, including the country's largest digital repository of Latino source materials, numbering over 140,000 pages. A Fulbright scholar, Dr. Nahr received his PhD in history at Stanford University. His first book, Jewish Thelonica, Between the Ottoman Empire and Modern Greece, won a National Jewish Book Award and the award for the best book from, modern Greeks, from the Modern Greek Studies Association. His new book project focuses on Sephardic Jews, race, and migration in the United States. And his talks are, and his, his talks tonight with the, a part of the Sephardic Digital Academy offer a little bit of a sneak peek to this new upcoming project. And I'm also proud to add one more note that he's one of the newest members of the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, returning back to his roots in the organization. Devin, please, whenever you are ready. Okay. Thank you, Ethan, for that introduction and to you and to the Sephardic Brotherhood for the opportunity to share some of my research and to address, uh, address you all this evening. I mean, I was just scrolling through here and it's wonderful to see many familiar names and faces and also many names and faces that I don't know. So welcome to everyone. Que venga enhorabuena. Um, I'd also like to express my gratitude to the Isaac Al Haddad Foundation, uh, as well as to Congregation Orva Shalom in Atlanta for uh, supporting tonight's program and the series and for enabling it to um, be possible. Um, at the beginning, I would just wanted to say that if you have questions or if you want to follow up, I think afterwards we'll have some time for, uh, for questions. Um, but also if you have family stories or if you have documents, you yourselves, if you are from Sephardic communities or families yourself, that may relate to some of the points that I'm going to be talking about in this talk or in the series of lectures, or uh, if you have some information or family stories that might take the narrative in a different direction, please, I'd be very interested in learning about it. Please share it with me. My email is, uh, we'll, we'll circulate the email on the chat afterwards, but it's D-E-N-A-A-R at uw.edu. And I'm always uh, happy to be in touch about, uh, about your family history and uh, any other aspects related to the Sephardic experience. And as you could uh, imagine, as Ethan alluded to, my um, interest in this subject is not only academic, but it is also personal and familial. Uh, and it is a special occasion for me to speak in a forum convened by the Hermandad Sephardit de America, the Sephardic Brotherhood of America, which is an organization that my family first joined shortly after my grandfather, his siblings, uh, and his parents, my great-grandfather, Rabbi Benjamin Nahr, and his wife, Rachel, were pictured there in the center in Salonika, 
shortly after they arrived in the United States, one of the first things that they did was they joined the Sephardic Brotherhood. Uh, you can see that um, here. This is actually their original application from 1925. And I would just point out a couple of things here. They're living in Harlem at the time on Madison uh, Avenue. Uh, and uh, my great grandfather's occupation is listed here as rabbi. It's like, I guess, a French kind of spelling. And I find very fascinating the languages that are mentioned here Hebrew as Spanish, Greek, and Turkish. And the Spanish is what he meant by, uh, by Ladino. And then he signs his name here, Benjamin Chaim Nar, in, uh, in, Ladin, in the, Hebrew, the Sephardic Hebrew uh, script uh, known as Solitreo. Uh, and my family was very involved in the Brotherhood for, uh, for many years and even for multiple um, generations. Uh, it was for the Brotherhood that my great-grandfather served as a rabbi in one of the Brotherhood's congregations also in Harlem. This is the Kehila Teferet Yisrael de la Hermandad Sefaradith de America, also on Madison Avenue. And this is an advertisement I found in one of the uh, Brotherhood's publications from 1928 called El Hermanado, the bro the, which means like the brother. And here uh, you can see it's an advertisement in Ladino, like in Spanish and Hebrew uh, letters, for the Yamim Noraim, for the Jewish High Holidays, uh, which will be conducted. Uh, las oraciones serán conducidas por los bien conocidos Hazanim, Hacham Rabbi Benyaminar, and then list some other people, Haim Natan, Abraham. Nahum, Abraham Cohen. So it says the uh, services will be conducted by the well-known uh, Hazanim, uh, Hacham uh, Benjamin Nar, and, uh, and others. So I thought this would be a nice illustration, again, of the long-standing connection of my family to this, um, to this organization. Uh, and I would also add that um, approximately five generations of my family are buried in the Sephardic Brotherhood's plot in New Brunswick, New Jersey, uh, which is where my family wound up settling. And uh, my great grandfather and subsequent generations were involved in the Sephardic community uh, there. Um, and I would just uh, finally mention that um, the Brotherhood uh, today is not no longer just a burial society. It never was, but it's very wonderful to see it restoring some of its earlier initiatives and reclaiming its historical role, not only as a mutual aid society and a burial organization, but also as a cultural and educational center. I'm very happy to be participating in this, pardon me, in this initiative of the um, Digital Academy. Um, I'm going to just mention a little bit about how I arrived at the topic of uh, today's talk. And uh, just to emphasize the extent to which family connections and stories um, have inspired and informed my research. Uh, my first book was about the Jews of Salonika, and it began as an effort to try to understand the world from which my family came. Uh, and also it became a kind of an, a window into the broader universe of the multilingual and multicultural world of the Ladino-speaking Sephardic Jews of Salonika and of the Ottoman Empire and of Greece, as I sought to better understand the vitality of that world and also the processes of its destruction and its erasure. And I had to learn a, like six languages in order to undertake this research, but these were all languages that two generations ago were common knowledge among members of my, uh, of my family. And um, I was very pleased by the way in which the book made an impact, not only here in the United States, but also back in Salonika in Greece, where I spent a lot of time. And it was actually a, a kind of a, a controversial book. The translators of the Greek edition were uh, very concerned about the ramifications of the book because of the work that I try to do with this book, among other things, not only to bring back to life the story of the Sephardic Jews of Salonika, but also to call out the historic intensity of anti-Semitism in Greece, to acknowledge um, issues of collaboration, and also to argue that it is possible to tell the story of the modern Greek nation and of modern Greece that has room and can include the Jewish experience. And all of this provoked the ire of hardcore nationalists and even some moderates in one, I wound up presenting that book in Salonika for the 
for the first time. The American consul insisted that I have an armed guard present and we even had to go over an escape route from the lectern prior to its beginning. Um, but what was really fascin uh, fascinating for me is that as someone descended from that community, but not living there every day, I had a kind of privilege. Um, I could visit, I could lay down my truth as I saw it based on my extensive research, but then I could leave and I wouldn't have to deal with it and the ramifications on a daily basis. Um, now, my new book project focuses on the United States. Now, the United States is where I live, and I cannot so easily run away, although in our days of uh, quarantine and social distancing, I can avoid, you know, uh, being on Zoom. Um, but in, a, in essence, I'm trying to do something similar, which is that I'm trying to draw inspiration from my own family experience, set that within a deep engagement with um, research, this time in eight languages, I'm even dipping into Yiddish this time around, as well as the broader historical context to try to tell a new story about Sephardic Jews in the United States, about race, about migration, and about what it means or could mean or has meant to be an American. Now, if you can believe it, I'm the first scholar of Sephardic background uh, by the way, I should acknowledge that I am Ashkafardic. I, I bring together both the Sephardic and the Ashkenazic traditions in my, own, uh, in my own family background and in my own life. But in this context, I'm focusing on the Sephardic experience. But I'm the first scholar of Sephardic background of any, any kind who is based at an American university to be writing a book about the history of the Sephardic Jews in the United States. If you can believe it, that's quite remarkable if you think about all of the hundreds, maybe even thousands of books that have been written about Jews in the United States. Now, of course, my work draws on the scholarship and publications of people who've come before me writing about Sephardic Jews in this country, including Joseph Papo, Rabbi Mark Angel, Professor Aviva ben Ur, and others, but it's, it, it's going in, uh, in some new directions. Um, and in general, scholarship on American Jewish history um, has not found a place for the Sephardic experience, at least not the Sephardic experience with roots in the Eastern Mediterranean, in the Levantine world, in the Ottoman Empire. That, those communities, we are usually invisible. We maybe get a footnote, or maybe we get nothing at all, almost as if just as in Greece, we never existed to begin with. And it's perhaps a feeling that might be shared by Jews of color in this country as well for similar but also some different reasons who are not necessarily part of our broad understanding of who Jews are in the United States and what their experiences are about. And I hope that my talks will begin to help explain some of that uh, invisibility. I've also discovered along the way um, that my research doesn't always correspond to the stories that have been handed down to me or to others that I know, the stories that are circulating in Sephardic communities across the United States, or to the numerous silences that exist in the transmission of the stories. You know, we tell our grandparents and our parents tell us stories for certain reasons, and sometimes not all of the nuance and not all of the difficult chapters of those stories are at the forefront of that process of narrativization. Um, I'm finding that the subject of my research, Jews, race, migration, American identity, these are topical issues. They're sometimes even provocative. They bring to the surface difficult aspects of our past sometimes, as Sephardim, as Jews, as Americans, and that these echo into the present. And what I'd like to suggest is that they call upon us to acknowledge and confront the ways in which our country has been historically, I'm gonna show you that in a moment, and maybe in some ways still today, uh, shaped by some systems that have been profoundly unjust. And they continue to operate in our country. It was in trying to grapple with and better understand where Sephardic Jews fit into the, the story of race and racism in the United States that Ethan and the Brotherhood approached me about doing this lecture series. Um, now, the title of this series is Sephardic Jews and Race in the United States, um, exploring systemic racism 
and Sephardic Jewry. And I'd just like to say a couple of words about what I mean by systemic racism. And it's a little bit maybe different from sometimes how we're accustomed to think about racism as kind of interpersonal prejudice or bigotry or hatred. That's not what I'm talking about or not only what I'm going to be talking about today and over the course of the next couple of lectures, but rather I'm going to be talking about the laws and the institutions and the practices that govern and shape both in explicit and often in insidious and unconscious ways, the experiences, the opportunities, and the closed off opportunities of those who inhabit our country. And they impact different groups of people in different ways. But this is an issue of a system, a, a systemic question, not only one of interpersonal dynamics. And I'd like you to please keep that in mind as I share the, uh, the results of my, some of my research with you today. And I hope you'll join for future sessions as well. Um, just to make the point clear, uh, you know, we're coming off of the 4th of July weekend, which provided, I think, an opportunity, as have recent events in this country more generally, to reflect on the tension, perhaps even the contradiction, that is evident in the founding documents of this country. You know, the Declaration of Independence, as you all know, clearly offers this purported promise that all men are created equal. But the reality was that the people who spoke and wrote those words and proclaimed that principle, they owned people as slaves, okay? This idea that all men are created equal at the time of the founding of this country, and this is what I mean in a systemic way, that sense of equality was only available to white people and specifically to white men, okay? The other point that I'd like to make is that um, we were be speaking about some perhaps challenging uh, ideas and uh, discourses as it relates to Sephardic Jews in the United States. But I want to emphasize that um, even though Sephardic Jews at certain points in time were the objects of uh, institutional or systemic racism, um, and we're going to look at those, especially as it relates to immigration and naturalization, um, the experience of Sephardic Jews, certainly Sephardic Jews, who have eventually been perceived to be white people have been radically different from black, black Americans in this country. And I don't wanna to try to create any kind of equivalence, but I do want to demonstrate the ways in which the experiences of a variety of different kinds of minoritized populations in this country have been shaped in different ways by these uh, systems, okay? So what are we going to be talking about today and moving forward? The three lectures are outlined as follows. Today, we're going to be looking at this issue of what I'm calling confrontation, the way in which Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire, and that's going to be sort of the framework that I'm going to be dealing with in these lectures. There are a variety of different communities that um, take on the title and designation of Sephardic Jews. Um, for most of our time, I'm going to be focusing on those Ladino-speaking Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire, and I'm happy to address how other kinds of Sephardic Jews fit into this framework. But I want to focus today on this issue of how Sephardic Jews confronted, grappled with the immigration and naturalization systems in the United States. These are interconnected but slightly different realms of possibility in this country that have to do with who can enter the country and who can legally, formally, officially lay claim to being an American, okay? Next Monday, and I hope you'll come back, we'll focus on the ways in which Sephardic Jews navigated this system. Now, if today it might look like Sephardic Jews will be in some ways targets of exclusion or restriction or forms of prejudice or oppression, I don't want to leave you with a sense of a victim narrative. Uh, that is not my objective at all. I want to share with you also narratives of empowerment 
And I think next week we'll be looking at the ways in which Sephardim sought to navigate a system that wasn't really designed with them in mind, and the way in which through the creation of institutions like the Sephardic Brotherhood of America, the sponsoring organization for this uh, program, as well as the Ladino newspapers published almost exclusively in New York, enabled Sephardic Jews to navigate the different systems operative in the United States. And finally, on the third session, I'd like to focus on the question and issue of transformation and the way in which Sephardic Jews were involved in a variety of political and social movements, some uh, of a wide variety of political lilts. Almost all of this participation has been um, uh, invisibilized. It's been rendered uh, mute. We, we know very little about it. Um, and I want to sort of restore some of this to our purview today uh, on the third session and also look at ways in which these political and social movements um, help to construct ties across racial and ethnic lines that brought Sephardic Jews in dialogue and cooperation with Latinx people, with uh, Black Americans, with a wide variety of other kinds of people in the American racial and ethnic landscape. So that is the program for today and for the subsequent sessions. Um, so with that, I'm going to delve in and I'm going to begin uh, with a very, uh, I think, provocative kind of statement. And for those of you, you know, looking at the words, I know many of you share Sephardic background with me. And I want you to recognize that when our parents or grandparents, or maybe in some cases, our great grandparents came to this country, we were considered the trash of the Mediterranean. And I mean this actually literally. These are the words of a Pennsylvania senator who was one of the chief architects of immigration restriction in this country. And this is what he had to say during a hearing on immigration in the Senate floor in 1929, a few years after the immigration restriction and the quotas were enacted in 1924, justifying them with a specific emphasis on people like us. And I found this very, very fascinating. For a long time before the war broke out in Europe, and he's referring to World War I, this country, the United States, was the trash basket of Europe. We got the trash of the Mediterranean, all that Levantine stock that churns around through there and does not know what his own ancestry is. It came, it, it, it came here in large numbers from Syria and the Turkish provinces and from different countries of the Balkan Peninsula and from all that part of Southeastern Europe. Okay, this is a very pointed kind of statement. And what he is doing is directing his ire at people from the Levantine world, as it was understood at that time. This world that is kind of at the crossroads between what is Europe and what is not, between where civilization ends and where barbarism begins, between the Christian world and the Muslim world. And this was a world at that time that stretched from the Balkans into the Middle East. It was the world, essentially, of the former Ottoman Empire. These groups, Sephardic Jews, Armenians, Syrians, and other Arabs, Turks, were the target of immigration restriction. Why? 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 Of all the peoples in the world, what is going on? And I think in order to understand that, we have to get a little bit of an understanding of the uh, mental attitudes and approaches, the thoughts and mentalities that were um, shaping policy and opinion in the United States, and not only in the early 20th century. And one of the dominant ways of thinking at that time was the thinking of race science or eugenics. And it is out of the race science environment which uh, imagines uh, and draws on the disciplines of anthropology 
and of linguistics and other kinds of sciences and applies them to the human domain and is very preoccupied with classifying populations and creating hierarchies and charts and determining who is at the top and who is at the bottom and to try to justify that according to scientific reasons, doing research that will be used to confirm what the advocates of this approach already believed, which is that white people are at the top and everybody else falls below some at the very, very bottom. It's out of this discourse of eugenics and race science in the 20th century that we get terms that are still with us today. The idea of a desirable immigrant or an undesirable immigrant. These were terms that were rooted and they were based on your identity, regardless of what you did, based on perceptions of your racial status. And here we have a chart on the left. I hope maybe you can see it if you can get close. This is a United States government official hierarchy and ranking of the races of the world from the most civilized at the top to the least civilized at the bottom. And this was a chart that was developed under the aegis of the president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, and it was a vast investigation into the status of immigration in the United States. And it was deeply influenced by academics and intellectuals and thinkers and politicians who were imbued with the ideas of race science. So they created a dictionary of the races. And if you have the chance, you can look at it online. It's fascinating. You can go look at the Hebrews and look at the Greeks and look at part of the, the Negroes, all the different groups have identities here and dictionary definitions. What, for our purposes, I would like to point out, and you're, this probably will come as no surprise to you to see this, is that we have Caucasian race, which is, these are all constructed ideas, and we're gonna get to them in a moment. And within the Caucasian race, we have the Aryan stock, and then we have these different groups, and the Teutonic people are at the top, okay? Scandinavian, the Danish, Norwegian, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, English, okay? And then you have these different groupings that incrementally decrease in their whiteness and in their status as civilized people. Now you can go down a little bit. We can get to the Semitic, oh, pardon me, what happened? To the Semitic group uh, here, which is kind of at the borderline, you have Arabian, Hebrew, and Syrian, and Jews were designated as Hebrews by race for immigration purposes in this country until after World War II, okay? And fascinating also to emphasize again that all of these different European or European adjacent peoples get their own kind of categories here. Whereas when you get down toward the bottom of this hierarchy, you have only really like one or two categories for wide swaths of the human population who are uh, flattened and rendered into just these sort of discrete categories that are I mean, conflating so many different kinds of peoples and languages and cultures and religious traditions. So you here have in the Mongolian uh, group here, you have Turkish are classed with Japanese and Korean, okay? And then you have East Asian, and then you have Pacific Islander, and then you have Negro. All the people of Africa get one classification there, and they are at the bottom only to be uh, ranked just above the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Okay, this was the official, official ranking of the races from the perspective of the US government that will shape immigration practices and policies in this country. Now, I brought for you here also a little quote from Madison Grant, who was one of the foremost immigration restrictionists of the era. He was one of the foremost and popular uh, thinkers on the issue of immigration and race in the United States. And I want to emphasize that he was not a marginal figure. He was a mainstream figure and his views, as you can see, are in many ways represented in this official US government dictionary of races. 
he was not from the South. He was from the North. He was from a long established uh, New England family. One of his ancestors had signed the Declaration of Independence. He was not ignorant. He was well educated at Yale and at Columbia. And he was buddies with President Theodore Roosevelt. And he was buddies with President Herbert Hoover. And he was into conservation. He was into the science and nature and how those related to the human world. He was interested in saving species and classifying the species. He established the Bronx Zoo and the Glacier National Park, but he also placed a Congolese man from the Belgian Congo on display next to the apes at the Bronx Zoo. Okay, this is the kind of man he was. He was involved in the Sierra Club. He was on the board of the Museum of National History which has been in the news with relationship to Roosevelt. And he was the director, the director of the American Eugenics Society and was a major proponent of immigration restriction and the proponent of anti-miscegenation laws. Laws that said that people of different races, especially whites and blacks, should not come, should not be able to marry or procreate. He even infamously received fan mail from one Adolf Hitler who called his book, The Passing of the Great Race, his Bible. Okay, so Hitler's Bible is written by an American. Just think about that for a moment. Now, here's a passage I bring to you. It's a really repugnant text, but it's fascinating to think about how this mentality shaped uh, American attitudes uh, and policies toward immigration. He says, the civil war in America has shattered the prestige of the white race, and it will take several generations and perhaps wars to recover its former control if it ever does regain it. The danger is from within and not from without, from within. Neither the black nor the brown nor the yellow nor the red will conquer the white in battle, but if the valuable elements in the Nordic race Mix with, mix with the inferior strains or die out through race suicide, then the citadel of civilization will fall for mere lack of defenders. Okay, this is the rhetoric, and this is the this is the argument that justifies immigration restriction. And what Grant was most interested in at this time, and other immigration restrictionists like him, were about removing from the body politique of American society, especially these liminal, the liminal people. The people are at the very bottom, he's not so concerned with in some ways, but it's the people that might have a claim on being white that he's most concerned with. And his biographer writes about how Grant was really preoccupied with people like Jews and Greeks and Armenians who are somehow at the borders between what is white and what is not. These ideas will be represented not only with regard to Levantines more broadly, but they will be directly related to Sephardic Jews in the United States. And you can go through the press during the early 20th century, and it's fascinating to see that there was like almost a hyper visibility of Levantine or Sephardic Jews. Today, we're mostly invisible. Nobody knows who we are, uh, not even in the Jewish world. Um, but back in the day, there was a lot of attention drawn to what were known as, here you can see Ladinos, who are described as another race problem in a syndicated article. This one I was, it came up, a, a colleague of mine uh, discovered this in the Springfield Republican, or here we have a type of the Oriental Jew who speaks the strange language Ladino. Um, here we have another of the Spanish Jews who do not come from Spain. <laughs> because they come from the Orient, they come from the Levant, they come from the Ottoman Empire. Here we have a recent bride of the strange Ladino. So you get the sense of the rhetoric. There's something that is strange, and there's something that is also problematic about the Sephardic Jews because they're emblematic of the mixity of the figure of the Levantine. What is their roots? Where are they from? They bring together so many strains. The elements that today I consider the strength of our heritage and our culture and our history were at that time in a world of uh, emphasizing racial and national purity grounds for um, vitriol and for criticism. Okay. There's a long story of immigration history, immigration restriction in the United States, and I, we don't have time to get into it all. I would just like to emphasize 
that immigration restriction in many ways begins in the 1880s with the Chinese Exclusion Act. The idea here is that um, people who are not white, not European, and especially Asians are going to be excluded from entering into this country, okay? And we're gonna look a little bit why ab about that, uh, why that is in the case, but over a period of 40 years, different levels of exclusion are introduced into the systems of US government, into the laws and practices of the land, such that by 1924, those eligible to enter the country in the first place are going to be reduced even more severely. So by 1924, in the wake of World War I, we have not only the continued exclusion of all people from Asia, in other words, if you're from Asia, you cannot even enter this country. But now if you're from certain parts of um, Europe or the Middle East, you will now be subject to quotas that will be very differential on eugenics ground, on the grounds of trying to preserve the true white character of the American populace. Okay, so quotas were set based on an earlier census of 1890, before a lot of immigrants started to come from Eastern and Southern Europe, where the primary targets, people who were considered these borderline figures, but who were considered really not the real white people, and they were deemed we need to limit them. And it's in 1924 with the consolidation of these quotas that we also get the establishment of the Border Patrol for the very first time. It doesn't exist prior to 1924. And the requirement of a visa to enter the country, not a requirement before that time. And essentially the creation, the invention of the category of the illegal alien. It is born in 1924 with these restriction uh, acts. And when the president signs this bill into law, which passes with overwhelming support both in the House and the Senate, he does so and says on the grounds that America must remain American. Okay, and the Commerce Secretary at the time, Hoover, also a president, will become a president, he argues that the biological and cultural grounds justify why there should be no mixture of Oriental and Caucasian blood. And here he probably means specifically Asian, but in the context of discourse at the time, the Near East, the Eastern Mediterranean, was also part of the Orient. Okay, So you can see the radical disproportionate allocation of these quotas. Germany, Great Britain, and Ireland, uh, even have, have relatively large quotas, comparatively speaking, Poland fewer, Italy even fewer, but now check out some of these places from the former Ottoman world and the slots that were available to people from that part of the world, the parts of the world from which the Levantine Sephardim came. 100 slots for the whole year for the whole country of Greece, Turkey, Lebanon and Syria, which was under French uh, mandate, Palestine under British mandate at the time. It became very, very difficult, very, very difficult to secure a visa to enter the country if you wanted to come from one of those countries or if your nationality was represented by one of these um, countries. And, you know, in fact, when this immigration law was put into place, there were about 10,000 Jews coming from Eastern Europe at different points en route to the United States who were not allowed to enter as a result of the passage of this law. What did people do? Many people sought to skirt the law by a variety of different means. And what I was really fascinated to discover was that my family was among them. Now, my family was only able to get a visa to come to the United States because of a special exemption in the quota laws which was there was a special exemption for ministers of any religion. So this was a, an opportunity for principally priests and ministers, Christian clerics of a variety of different types to enter the country, but it also became a way for a certain number of rabbis to enter the country. So it is only due to this special exemption that my family was able to get a visa in the first place. It was a non-quota visa, and I'll show you that in a moment. But in order to get the whole family in the country, because as individual people, my great-grandfather's children 
uh, could not get visas. They had to do something a little bit illicit, but something that could have been punished if it were caught at the time by imprisonment or massive fines. And that was they fudged the dates of birth to render the children that were coming uh, essentially minors and eligible to come on the family passport. So here we have from my great grandfather's uh, family records. You have on the left, the records in Ladino, uh, the, everybody's birth dates, the children's names and their birth dates. It's Segun Data a la Franca, according to the French, the European date. Um, and then it has the names of all the children. You can see the dates, 1903, 1905, 1907, 1910. And then we have in English here, these are the birth dates that were forwarded to the registration board. And everybody is made, the, the older children are made a few years younger. So the kid, the, the oldest son who was born in 1903, ah, we tell the officials 1905. And this is a little slight, right? It's a little, uh, you know, it, it's a little fabricated fudging of the numbers, but it accomplished the goal. And everybody was able to come to the country, except for the oldest son, my Tio Salomon, who remained in, uh, in Greece after having been in the United States, by the way. Uh, he went back to Greece after the war. And at a certain point, uh, he tried to secure a visa beginning in 1929. And for the next 13 years or so, every year he applied for a visa, could not get it. And he and his wife and two children wound up being murdered then afterwards. Here's the non-quota visa uh, that my family wound up getting. Um, and I was very fascinated to see this document here. You can see he's a Greek but in terms of his nationality. And again, I always find the languages fascinating here. He calls it Spanish, by which he means Latino, Hebrew. He is a rabbi. And Turkish, he was born in the Ottoman Empire. He grew up in the Ottoman Empire. He'd only been living in Greece for uh, just a few years, 12 years. At this time, he's uh, 45. So most of his life was living as an Ottoman. And you can see also by his garb that that is, uh, that is represented here. So my family is able in some ways to skirt these draconian immigration laws that were established. And I want to emphasize this, the main justification for the establishment of these restriction laws are uh, perceptions of race science and the suitability of different kinds of people to participate in the American experience. Okay. Now, the final thing I just wanna bring to you your attention. When we think about America, we, we oftentimes think America, you know, a nation of immigrants. Um, the first point to make there is that the idea of the United States as a nation of immigrants is a post-World War II understanding of the term. The, the, the concept nation of immigrants is literally developed in the 50s and 60s. It is a Cold War concept, and I'd be happy to address that later. But in the 1920s, there was one person in particular who was looking on at what the United States was doing with great interest. And that was a young politician coming up in, the, in, in Germany, and uh, he would be in prison for a short time, as you know, uh, a gentleman by the name of Adolf Hitler, who in his mind comes the only country that he speaks about with admiration and which he hopes to provide inspiration for what uh, he would like to see happen in his own Germany at some point is the United States, which he saw as the closest country in the world to achieving something like a racial utopia. Now, that might be hard for us to accept, but I want you to recognize the power of this, the power of the way in which institutionalized racial and racist policies in the United States provided inspiration for none other than Hitler. Look, he says, the racially pure and still unmixed German Aryan, remember Germans have the highest quota number in the United States, has risen to become master of the American continent. And he will remain the master as long as he does not fall victim to racial pollution. The American Union simply excludes the immigration of certain races. And if you read Mein Kampf, just to interject something here, he says, the way in which the United States 
uh, exterminated the indigenous peoples of the Americas, enslaved uh, Africans, prevented blacks and whites from marrying each other and producing mixed race children. He says, these are all admirable qualities and policies that Germany should adopt. For him, what sealed the deal was the institution of immigration restriction, which he said created a kind of totalizing system of racial exclusion. In these respects, to continue the quotation, America already pays obeisance, at least in tentative first steps, to the characteristic bulkish racial conception of the state. Okay. This is the United States of the first quarter of the 20th century, as it was operative in terms of its institutions and as it was perceived in some, uh, in some places abroad. Now, I'd like to turn our attention for the remainder of our talk um, for the next few moments, uh, not on immigration, but on naturalization. And the reason why the immigration policies are going to become much more restrictive in this period is because what the restrictionists are trying to do is to prevent those who are not eligible to become citizens of this country from even entering the country in the first place. Now, what does it mean? What do you mean? What does it mean to be eligible for citizenship in this country? If we go back to the founding of the United States, in the first Congress back in 1790, there is only one prerequisite to become a citizen of the United States. And that is that you demonstrate that you are a free white person. Okay, this again, this is what I mean, institutional racism. There are uh, uh, systemic racism. Only white people were eligible to become citizens of the United States beginning in 1790 and racial pre prerequisites to become a citizen of this country continued and persisted until 1952. Okay. At the same time that the United States is legislating who can become an American citizen, I would add that it's very important to note that the founding fathers did not debate this clause. They debated how many years do you have to live in the country in order to become a citizen, whether you can become a citizen if you are of the aristocracy or if you have to own land or how old you have to be. Nobody questioned this principle here of being a free white person. That was unanimously agreed upon. Some people said even that's too broad. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was uh, known to have said that he thought even Germans were too far removed from real white people and maybe they shouldn't really be part of the polity. Okay, so that gives you a sense of how this was being perceived at the time. And it's at the same time that some of you might be familiar with the famous letter that Washington writes to the Spanish and Portuguese Jewish community of Newport, Rhode Island, where he speaks about toleration. And he speaks that the government of the United States gives bigotry to no, gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under its own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. Now, obviously, as you know, Washington owned black people as property, as slaves, and the founders and leaders of the Toro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, also some of them, including Aaron Lopez, um, one of the main founders, owned and traded slaves. So obviously the implication here is that these kinds of protections and opportunities will only be available to white people, okay? Clearly, if you are black, you are not going to be you are not going to be protected from bigotry. You are not going to be sitting in safety under your own vine and fig tree. And there, it definitely will be people to make you afraid. Okay, I think that that's very clear. Now, this is the instantiation of this principle. I'm not saying that it hasn't changed. Okay, but I want to point out the systemic roots of this issue that we have to identify and we have to um, address. And I think this leads us 
when we arrive at the 20th century to the question of race really being the organizing principle of uh, the American experience in some way. W.B. Du Bois says something I think very profound here, and he says the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. The relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America, and the islands of the sea. On which side of that color line will you find yourself will be so instrumental in determining what paths and opportunities will be open to you and what will be closed off. Now, I'd like to emphasize, however, that race at this time was not only about color. It was sometimes about color, but it was sometimes about other things as well. I'm drawing on a wide variety of other scholars. I'd like to suggest that race is an ideological, cultural, and political, and legal concept that has to do with the instantiation of power. It is regularly reconstructed based on context and contingency. It's not neutral. It's not biologically determined. As we saw, these people invented this chart <laughs> of the races, and they created a hierarchy. And whiteness in this context, or at least being not black, becomes a kind of vortex that sucks everyone in. And what do I mean by this, uh, whiteness as a vortex? One of the things that that 1790 naturalization law did not do was it didn't say who a white person is. It didn't define it. It was sort of taken for granted, although there was some discussion about who is white and who is not. And what you see in the wake of the Civil War and the rise of mass migration in, during the Reconstruction in the 1770s, 80s, and onwards are the beginning to have debates about who is white and who is not. And this actually becomes a theme that is adjudicated and decided upon by the courts of the United States. This is a major, major issue. And you know, before I began this project, I'll be honest with you, I did not know about this. You know, I did not know about this. Uh, and I was surprised having uh, gone through an entire education, having even uh, received my PhD before I learned about this. I'm not an American historian, so that may help explain it. But now that I'm getting more involved in American history in the last 10 years, I was really uh, uh, surprised mostly that I did not know this. How could it be I didn't know this? <laughs> Between the 1878 and 1952, there are at least 51 court cases that different courts in the United States, including the Supreme Court on two occasions here to determine who is white and who is not and who is eligible for citizenship and who is not. And the plurality of the cases, and this is something nobody has noticed before, the plurality of the cases all involve people coming from the Ottoman Empire and the successor states. These are these uh, Levantine people, these intermediate people, the what were known at the time perhaps potentially mongrel, uh, hybrid races or peoples. The Ottoman, these Ottoman and former Ottoman immigrants navigated and tested these ambiguous boundaries of who is white and who is not. Now, I need to add one other caveat, which is that after the Civil War, with the uh, granting of citizenship to Africans. Uh, African Americans, the Black Americans in the, the emancipation uh, after the Civil War, the naturalization law was adopted, uh, excuse me, uh, modified to say that free white people or people of African nativity. So the only two classes of people who could become citizens after the Civil War until 1952 are white people or people of African nativity. Now, what if you are not clearly Black and what if you are not clearly white? you might very well have your status adjudicated by the American courts. And this is precisely what happens. Of these 50 whatever cases, all of the, all of the uh, petitioners who are neither clearly white nor clearly black, they intuit something very readily that was obvious to anybody and didn't even need to be spoken, but I do want to acknowledge it here, is that not one of these 51 cases tried to make the claim that they were eligible for citizenship on the grounds that they were Black. Nobody did it. There was a clear recognition that that would not gain you, in fact, all of the rights that were officially supposed to be afforded to you by citizenship. 
all of these different kinds of people. And look at the wide variety of kinds of people here that went to the courts petitioning and claiming that they were white. And they drew on very uh, creative and fascinating arguments to demonstrate why, that they're, why they are white. And you will see that some of these different groups, they had their status adjudicated multiple times and some courts ruled that they were white and some courts ruled that they were not white. The folks in bold here, those different groups, those are the ones that were ruled both white and not white. Ultimately, the folks ruled white are on the right side and many of these other people ruled uh, not white. Um, so how did the arguments play? And then how does it relate to our story of Sephardic Jews in the United States? Now, <clears throat> whiteness, as I mentioned, is not necessarily about skin color. It's about perceptions of civilizational status, mores, behaviors, ideas, values, Okay, and so in the New York Times has a big article in 1909 with the following question. Is the Turk a white man? And by which they mean, they were calling at this time, anybody from the Ottoman Empire is a Turk. So they say the American courts have barred from citizenship already, Chinese, Japanese, Burmese, and their half-breeds, again, the language here is going to be a little bit challenged. Will they bar Turks? The original Turks were of the yellow or Mongolian race. You can see here's the race science rhetoric playing out. But in their westward progress, the Turks freely intermingled with the Caucasian races whom they subjugated. The Turks today are descendants of Arabs, Kurds, Slavs, Albanians, and Greeks. But here is the kicker. But the Turkish mind does not work like as ours. They are a cruel and massacring people, and they have lost none of their ancient proclivities. But they are, as Europeans, as much white people as the Huns, the Finns, and the Cossacks. So what is the process that comes into play with regard to the people from the Ottoman Empire trying to demonstrate that they are white people? Argument number one, we're not Turks. <laughs> this is the argument made by Syrians. It's the argument made by Ar Armenians. The other arguments that are drawn to demonstrate the whiteness of these Ottoman subjects, especially for Armenians and for Syrians, is why, are, why am I white? Because I am Christian. Most of the Syrians coming at this time were Christian, and they saw that Christianness was tied up in American conceptions of whiteness, so much so that the two could not be disentangled from each other at the time. So you have a wide variety of people going to the court saying that, look, I'm white because I'm Christian. I'm white because I only speak English at home and with my children. I'm white because I participate in civic institutions. These all become justifications for whiteness. The, one of the cases involving a Syrian comes before the court. And he says, <clears throat> he's a Syrian Christian, he says, I am white. And the, the judge says, you are not white. You're bronze. This is the term that says, you are bronze. He says, well, I'm the same color as Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ were before you asking for citizenship in the United States, would you give him citizenship in the United States? And this particular judge says, if he looked like you, no. So again, it's not only about perceptions of culture and values. It is about how you look. It is about a variety of combination of these kinds of ideas. Now, it becomes a conversation about Jews quite readily as well in the case of the Syrians. Because at this time, as we saw in that chart earlier on, Syrians are classed as, uh, as Semites along with Jews who are described as Hebrews. And so when the case of Syrian folks, their eligibility for naturalization comes into question, American Jews, by which I mean Eastern European and Central European origin Jews in this country, are very concerned. They're very concerned that if it turns out that Syrians who are designated as Semites are ruled not white and ineligible for citizenship, maybe all Jews would be designated as um, Semitic and not European and therefore not white. So all the major Jewish organizations come behind and support the Syrians' claim that they are white. It's very fascinating. Nobody, by the way, says there's a problem with the system. There's, there's something unjust about the system. 
The system says that only white people become citizens. Nobody made that argument, including the Jewish leaders in the United States. Made their argument was that the parameters of whiteness need to be expanded to include us. And if it needs to include Syrians in order to include us, we are going to go with it. Okay. But now the question becomes more interesting because American Jews and American judges and the representatives of the institutions are even willing to make a distinction between different kinds of Jews. So one of the arguments for Syrian naturalization is that the matter has been settled in the favor, uh, in their favor as the European Jews have been admitted without question since the passage of the statute and that Jews are one of the Semitic peoples. So say, listen, if you're gonna let Jews become citizens, you should let Syrians become citizens because in the race science thinking of the time, both of these people are Semites and we are part of the white people. <clears throat> Now, what does the judge say? The judge say, says that the Jew is racially, physiologically, and psych psychologically a part of the peoples he lives among, a professing Jew from Syria who is not of European nativity or descent would be equally Asiatic as the present applicant and as such not within the terms of the statute. And so in this instance, Syrian Jews are excluded from uh, the possibility of naturalization uh, at this time. And the implication is that Syrian Jews might also be excluded. Eventually, this is overturned. And, and Syrians, as all Middle Easterns, Easterners would be recognized as white, and that exists and per continues until today. Middle Easterners, when they fill out their, their uh, census forms, you are supposed to check mark white. And that's the result of these court cases from 100 years ago. I want to conclude now with just two slides. The way in which within the Jewish community, um, these same rhetorics are internalized. And this is going to be a segue for our conversation next time. Okay, the National Conference of Jewish Charities convenes a meeting, which was a major philanthropic organization like today's federations and says, replicating the, uh, the, the rhetoric of the judge in the Syrian case makes the same distinction. The psychic and psychological difference between the Levantine Jew and our Russian, Austrian, and Romanian colleagues, uh, and Romanian co-religionists. He says, there is vast difference. So great is the difference that there seems to be little in common. The point of similarity are few. The Levantine Jew is as human, or almost as human, as any other. And you see the process of the internalization of these systemic discourses and framing of the hierarchies, creating an internal Jewish hierarchy. Like Jews in general, are per, they are concerned. There is anti-Semitism in this country. There is the rising immigration restriction. They want to create distance between themselves and the smaller in number, newly arriving Levantine Jew, whom they are afraid may make them look less white, may make them look less civilized by association. The last quote here, which we'll talk about more next time, from Lewis Hacker, begins the first academic study of Sephardic Jews in the United States. Um, in 1926, he was a scholar uh, uh, associated with uh, at Columbia University. He became a dean at Columbia University, and he was a personal friend of Eisenhower. And he begins his study by saying that Sephardic Jews are as alien to their Ashkenazi kinsmen as are the Negroes to the average white Southerner. That is a very potent and powerful and damning comparison in that period of time in which segregation exists, in which anti-miscegenation laws exist. And that's a theme that we're going to return to next time. I would like to conclude only by saying that we have some examples in Seattle, for example, of judges denying Sephardic Jews naturalization. 
uh, on the grounds. We don't have the specific grounds articulated, but I suspect the particular judge who was active in Seattle, the Naturalization Commissioner, Judge John Speed, was very active in promoting the exclusion of Armenians and Turks from the rights of citizenship in the United States. And uh, we can infer at this point that he was probably seeing Sephardic Jews in the same category. And this guy, Yudha de Leon, is successful in getting his citizenship in the 1920s, and he goes there and performs his whiteness. He speaks fluent English, came as a child from Ottoman Rhodes. He had gone to the University of Washington. He was involved in civic, in, uh, civic enterprises in Seattle. He could demonstrate his suitability for citizenship in the United States. I'd like to conclude by showing that by just emphasizing that while Sephardic Jews were never the principal target of systemic racism in this country, they were at certain points among the targets. And while anti-Semitism and other forms of interpersonal prejudice, including the potential for violence, extreme violence, continue to exist, they are not any more systemic for Sephardic Jews in this country, at least not those of us who generally look or appear to be white. And it's different if you are Sephardic or Jewish and black, okay? But that does not mean that just because we may not be the targets of systemic racism doesn't mean that systemic racism does not exist. To the contrary, by having crossed that color line onto the white side of the color line, and we're gonna talk about more of that later on, we are in some ways implicated in these very systems of injustice now often in ways that we may not be aware of. Once we recognize those injustices, it doesn't mean that we're guilty. It doesn't mean that it's guilty. But it means, I think, that we have a responsibility to act. James Baldwin, the Black American writer, once wrote that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Nahr, uh, for a great first kicker uh, starting, uh, starting us off for our first part one in the three-part series. We're going to take a moment now to open up uh, the floor to questions, and we're going to do it in two ways. Either A, you can submit them in the chat box, and you'll submit them. It'll be submitted. I'll see them, and I'll read them out, so Professor Nahr can read them out and, and answer them publicly. Or you can use the blue raise hand function the little blue raise hand function of the tab, <laughs> clicking on yourself on the tab and participants and being able to raise your hand function. Okay, great. So feel free again to write a question in the chat and you're able to, to answer them as well. So we'll start off with a question, uh, Dr. Nara, did religion play a role in immigration restrictions of the European quotas? I'm sorry, did uh, religion? Did religion play a role in the immigration restrictions of European quotas? It's a, it's a great question. So. The way that the quotas worked was they were organized officially according to nationality. But the way that nationality was defined and constituted brought together conceptions about race and religion and civilizational status. Um, so I think that uh, the way that religion plays in here is that Christianity and Protestantism are going to be the best uh, markers of whiteness. And if you are Protestant, you are not going to be subject to the kinds of immigration restrictions that even Catholics, and then even more so Eastern Orthodox, and then even more so uh, Jews, and then even more so Muslims are going to be subjected to. You know, we, we, you may be familiar with the, 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 the policies that uh, the current administration has implemented to bar, among other countries, countries with majority Muslim population. There's a precedent for that from the early 20th century, what I like to call uh, the first uh, Muslim ban, so to speak, which was done in a kind of roundabout way because they didn't wanna say, we're not gonna let Muslims into this country. What they said was, we are barring polygamists. It's very interesting. And so in some parts of the Muslim world, polygamy was practiced in, uh, in parts of the Muslim world. And uh, this became a tool that immigration officials used to exclude not only Muslims who are practicing polygamy, but also anybody who was Muslim. And this became a big uh, 
uh, caused a, a, a big uh, kind of scandal that was brought to the attention of the American government by Journal de Salonique, a French Jewish newspaper published in Salonica in 1910 that forced the, uh, uh, the US government to amend the way that it implemented its uh, Muslim uh, exclusion of people practicing polygamy because in some circles it was interpreted as excluding anybody from the Ottoman Empire. So in this regard, religion was a key factor to understanding uh, the way in which immigration restriction played out. Thank you so much for that answer. We have another question um, for Sherry Rind. Uh, she's asking regarding a bibliography. She's interested in if you have any recommendations for further reading and research on kind of this topic for today. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great scholarship on some of the broader kinds of themes that I uh, referred to. Um, I think May Nye's book, and uh, maybe I can, can I type it out here? Uh, is there a way to send it to everybody? Let's see. Uh, we can send it as a follow-up email. Okay, well. you can send it as a follow-up, yeah. So I can send a follow-up. Yes, there's some really excellent scholarship, both on immigration restriction and on this question of adjudicating whiteness. Um, there is not much stuff um, on tying those pieces to the Levantine Sephardic experience. So that's what I'm trying to do. And in the process, I think I have some modifications for how that really excellent scholarship might think about the questions that it's involved with. But there are, and also on, on, on black Jewish dynamics or what's sometimes called black Jewish relations, there's also a really great set of scholarship there. Of course, remembering that black Jewish relations is a problematic category because of course, some blacks are Jewish and some Jews are black. A uh, question from Kara Life. I believe the quota numbers from the chart were from 1924. Do you know about the quotas previously to 1924? And I'm particularly curious about Turkish quotas. Yeah, so I, uh, the, the first quotas were established in 1921, and they, uh, I don't have the numbers off the, top of my, uh, off the top of my head, but they were also followed the same principle, but were slightly higher. Uh, like one number that comes to mind is 124 for Turkey and 226 for Greece, but don't quote me on that. I probably shouldn't have said it because this is being recorded, but so now I can say that. But uh, th 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 there were slightly other numbers that were operative, um, but they were really, uh, these were enforced, by the way. I mentioned that the naturalization quotas were in force until, uh, uh, pardon me, the naturalization racial prerequisites were in force until 1952. The uh, nationality quotas were in effect until 1965. Okay, so until 1965, there were quotas based on nationality. But what you can see happening in the natural is in the in the immigration documentation is that after World War II, things begin to change. And I've literally seen immigration manifests manifestos for uh, Jews coming from Rhodes or from Turkey or other places like that, where in the category for race, uh, where it says Hebrew, it's literally crossed out, and on on top is written white. So you can literally see through uh, the stroke of a pen, the entire racial classifi classification system in this country is, is, is rewritten. And Jews, as more generally white looking Jews in the post-World War II period will increasingly enter into that white side of the color line dividing American society. Another question from Michael Bayo. How do the Sephardic Jews from Ottoman Empire coming to the United States see themselves? Do they see themselves as Europeans or as Middle Eastern or something different? Lecture two. <laughs> I'm not gonna give it away. So this one was the confrontation and the next one is navigation, in which I'm going to try to give you, I didn't give you much of the Sephardic voice here and I recognize that. And that is an imbalance in this talk that I will uh, counter in the next two uh, talks, we will hear much more from the Sephardic Jews themselves, how they saw themselves and how they thought about this experience. So please hold that question and please tune in next Monday. Rabbi Bale, thank you. Uh, Hilda Matrani question, in other parts of the world, Armenians have also faced a great deal of discrimination. How do they gain such relative approval in the United States? <laughs> well, it is relative approval, <laughs> I, would, I would guess. Like, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, Armenians were really on the border, on the border in, in, in many ways. Um, in fact, the first people who were successfully, who had their, natural, their naturalization 
uh, their citizenship rescinded or denied, and then were able to appeal it and successfully get it by proving that they were white, were both in 1909, uh, both in December, one in Atlanta, one in Boston, of a Syrian guy and an Armenian guy who were able to prove that they were white. And part of it had to do with the advocacy that these groups invested in proving their whiteness, in performing their whiteness. Like, it, you know, it became about essentially the way that the, uh, the scholarship explains it is that what initially became a way of thinking about who is white and who is not based on scientific means, that eventually was thrown out by the court because there was one case in particular of a South Asian man who claimed on scientific grounds that he, be, by being a high caste uh, Indian, uh, actually of Aryan origin, he was white and he was granted citizenship. I mean, he's brown, but he, on scientific grounds, he said that he was white. And the Supreme Court overruled that because they chose, they wanted to sustain the practices that they wanted to sustain. So they eventually overthrew their previ the previous ruling and said that we will no longer accept scientific evidence as a way to determine who is white and who is not. We will be using the common knowledge approach, which is to say, if you ask somebody walking down the street, is this person white? or is this person not white? And by which they mean a white person, ask a white person, this person white or this person not. If that regular person will say that person is white, then they're eligible for citizenship. So it becomes, again, literally, it's about walking down the street. It's about performativity. It's about how you shape your appearance, your approach, your affect, your um, gestures. I would add just one other caveat here, is that in the same way that Armenians experienced different national contexts differently, so did Sephardic Jews, Levantine Jews from the Ottoman Empire. In France, really did not encounter the same kind of problem, principally because many uh, Sephardic Jews had gone to the Alliance Israelite Universelle, this French Jewish school system that had schools all throughout the Ottoman Empire, and they could speak fluent French, and on a civilizational basis, they were much closer to uh, the, uh, the French, the, the real French people than many other immigrant groups. So they were able to enter, not really toward the bottom of the racial hierarchy or civilizational hierarchy in France, but uh, much closer to the, to the, uh, to the top. Uh, and in other countries, it played out in other ways. Joyce Bonazer asks, how come the Spanish background of the Ottoman Jews was not brought in as a reason to claim whiteness? Lecture two. It, it's an excellent question, and it is, it's going to, that is going to be one of the chief moves as a strategy of building and framing identity that Sephardic Jews are going to make, is that they are going to try the leadership, with few exceptions, are going to claim that they are Spanish essential. Another question, did the U.S. Supreme Court hear any of the race determination cases and make a ruling? Yes, yes, so they did. So there are two cases that the Supreme Court ruled on. Uh, one is the, the Finn case, which I just mentioned, the, uh, the South Asian case, and there was also a Japanese case uh, in which the, the Supreme Court ruled that in both of these cases that the people are not white. The Japanese, the Japanese case is really interesting because uh, Ozawa, um, for a variety of different reasons, and in a book, uh, I would recommend a book called uh, uh, White by Law by Ian Haney Lopez at uh, Berkeley, and we can send it out maybe uh, afterwards, but in there you can learn more about this case. And the argument there goes, this Japanese guy says, I'm white. And the court says, why are you white? He says, look at my skin. I have fair complected skin. My skin is lighter than the olive complected skin of a Spanish person or an Italian person. And if a Spanish person or an Italian person can get citizenship on the grounds that they're white, so can I. And then he argues that I speak only English at home. I belong to a white church. I go send my kids. So the same arguments. And they said, no, we're not going to use that kind of evidence anymore. We're going to be using this uh, a, a kind of a physiognomical about how do you look and how do you act in the street? You don't look like a white person, no matter how much you perform that whiteness. Raymond Nara asks, maybe your family relation perhaps. Hi, Raymond. Uh, <laughs> what were the social forces that brought about the McCarran Act? Uh, what changed between 1910 and 1924? 
Um, well, uh, World War I would be the biggest contributing factor um, to the change in immigration policy and into the change in which the United States sees, uh, United States officials see the constitution of the country because you have many refugees that are produced by the war and many people trying to enter the United States. I mean, despite all of the characteristics that I described, the United States remained a very desirable place for people to come to, right? It's not like because of all of these restrictions and things that people are like, I'm not going to the United States. Although you do get that in the, in the Ladino press. You say, don't go to the United States. It's not what you think it is. And I was very surprised to find that people were aware of these kinds of dynamics. Um, but it's World War I that really shifts the, shifts the minds, especially of the restrictionists, restrictionists wanting to stave off what they referred to as an invasion of people, especially from Eastern and Southern Europe at the front lines of the war of the Middle East, uh, and where they thought that the constitution, the, 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 the racial constitution of the real Americans, the white Americans, the Nordic Americans was going to be um, undermined. I mentioned to you the figure of Reed, Senator Reed from Pennsylvania, who was one of the chief architects of the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act. The other chief architect was a guy by the name of Albert Johnson, who was a senator in my state of Washington. He represented Tacoma, and uh, he was uh, very vociferously anti-Black. He was anti-South Asian. He was uh, backed by the Ku Klux Klan, but he was also virulently anti-Semitic. And he saw, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase the quote, but he said something in 1919 to the effect that Jews are dangerous and un-American in their behaviors and their habits, and we cannot let them into this country. What he is referring to also there is the association or the stereotype between Jews and communism after the 1917 Russian Revolution, and this would be another concern. Not only these racially inferior kinds, racially inferior kinds of people coming into the country, but also people who would be seeking to overthrow the systems of, uh, of democracy in the United States. I think we have time for just a few more questions, but we'll, sure. we'll, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can. And we apologize if we don't get to everyone's. There is a lot of great questions here, and I encourage you to also engage with uh, Professor Nord directly will head out his email if he's okay with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much uh, for this talk. As a scholar activist on these issues, I'm really grateful for your talk. Can you talk a little bit about this ki same kind of hierarchy in the U.S. that has been produced in the creation of the state of Israel and its ongoing policies of socializing Jews and other non-Jews? Um, yeah, so um, there is a dialogue. Um, because the way in which, the way that I, I've, so, I've sometimes explain it to my students is that eugenics and race science was a kind of cosmopolitan racism, if we can call it that. Uh, the figures that were involved in developing these scientific understandings of racial hierarchies and racial understandings um, included Swedish, uh, German, British, French, and American thinkers, politicians, and um, policymakers. The keynote speaker at, I think it was the first or maybe second international eugenics symposium, which was held in London, was uh, Lord Balfour, who is the person who creates the Balfour Declaration that promises a homeland to the Jewish people in Palestine. He was a eugenicist. And there's nothing unusual about that. I mean, so, so was, uh, so was, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean, it was ubiquitous, this way of, way of thinking in the United States. And it would be unreasonable, uh, pardon me, in, in Europe at this time, and it would almost be unreasonable to expect that these kinds of attitudes of racial thinking uh, and racist thinking did not uh, shape the early ways in which the, uh, some of the Zionist leaders and some of the people who would establish the state of Israel would, uh, would think about matters. And um, you certainly have the uh, reproduction or a, a reinstantiation of these same kinds of intra-Jewish hierarchies in the context of, uh, of, of Israel and, uh, and Palestine from the beginning of the 20th century. If you're really interested in one of the main figures who was developing these racial hierarchies, 
um, in the context of the Zionist movement and in early uh, Jewish settlement in Palestine, uh, take a look at a guy by the name of Arthur Rupin. I've written a little bit about him. Um, myself, he was a, uh, a eugenicist and a anthropologist and a faculty member at one of the founding members of uh, Hebrew University. So a very important intellectual, one of the founders of Tel Aviv. And he has a whole racial explanation as to why Ashkenazim are better than uh, Sephardim and Mizrahim. He doesn't call them Mizrahim, he calls them Oriental Jews. And he, he gives you a whole scientific uh, explanation um, about it. So yes, those ideas did shape that context as well. Now, that, that to say, this is, this is the description. I mean, this, this is the reality, this is the reality. Now, what we do with it, you can decide. Question from our friend, Dr. Jane Wietschebach. Uh, wasn't Hitler's admiration for the US also based on the extensive and emphatic anti misgeneration legislation in a majority of states? Yes, absolutely. So uh, among, I, I, I think um, Hitler's admiration for the United States was predicated on the way in which, I think the term he uses, the way in which the United States imprisoned, uh, exterminated and imprisoned the Native Americans, enslaved uh, blacks, and then also prevented blacks and whites from uh, marrying and, uh, and having offspring essentially through, uh, through sanctioned manners. And this would of course continue until the 1960s until the Loving case comes about. And what Hitler does, and there's a really great book on this topic called uh, Hitler's uh, American Model that came out one or two years ago by a legal professor, a legal scholar. And he talks about how in the 30s, the Nazi party sends researchers to the United States to study the anti-miscegenation laws and we're trying to think about how those kinds of interracial prohibitions on marriage can be introduced into Nazi Germany with regard to Jews and Aryans. And so in some ways, the anti-miscegenation laws uh, in the United States become a kind of model or template for the Nuremberg laws in Nazi Germany. Absolutely. Uh, Ivy Jane asks, are you finding that Ottoman Jews skirted quotas through first immigrating to South America and getting naturalized in Argentina, for example? Excellent, excellent question. And the answer is yes. Now, um, so this, after 1924 especially, because of the quotas, many Ottoman Jews and other people from the Ottoman Empire, Syrians and, and other people in general, Chinese, many different kinds of people go to different parts of uh, Latin America, Mexico, Cuba, Argentina, uh, and then they come to the United States, acquire citizens, they come to the United States, especially Mexican citizens. Due to the demands of agribusiness in the American Southwest, Mexicans in the racial hierarchy and the racial classification in the United States were designated as white people. This has to do with the legacy of American uh, imperialism in that part of the world and also the demands of, uh, of, natural, of, uh, pardon me, of, um, of agro-business. So if you were Mexican, a Mexican national, and there were a few Mexicans coming to the United States at the time on a permanent basis, there was much more cyclical uh, migration, uh, seasonal migration, if you're Mexican, you could present yourself in the United States, you could come right in. There were no quotas for Mexicans and there, were no, and there was no prohibition against becoming a citizen of the United States. Now that led to a number of people, this happened in my family, one of my great uncles who, who was the Hazan at, our, at the, my synagogue and he really made a very important impact on me, uh, taught me uh, much of the early Ladino that I knew, especially the Sephardic liturgy. He had, taken this path from, uh, from Salonika, then to Turkey, and then from Turkey to uh, eventually to Mexico. And he entered the United States at Fort Laredo, Texas, which is still a crossing point, claiming to be Mexican, both by nationality, by birth, and by race. Came right in. And he was under a, under a pseudonym. He was naturalized, claiming to be Mexican. And he lived his whole life, as far as I can tell, as a Mexican, I mean, in terms of what the government thought he was in terms of his birth and in terms of his original nationality, um, the only document that I have found 
of him that indicates his true place of birth is his death certificate. So this was definitely a strategy that was employed by, uh, by people. And there is a new book coming out by my colleague, uh, Devi Mays, um, uh, who looks at this frontier of the Mexico-US border and smuggling and uh, moving across that border as it relates to Sephardic Jews. And I also point out another book by a colleague, um, Adriana Brodsky, who wrote a great book a couple of years ago about Sephardic Jews in Argentina which I recommend that you take a look at. I think we're gonna start wrapping up in a few moments. I'll ask maybe two more questions. There's so many great questions that I apologize again to everybody. I just wanna be mindful it is 10 p.m. on the East Coast right now. And I'd also be mindful that Dr. Nara has some young Ijikos at home as well. So I would be aware of that as well. <laughs> They're gonna answer the rest of the questions, so. <laughs> right, go um, Dory asks, can you speak to the impact of performing whiteness that has had on the assimilation and loss of culture and tradition for Sephardic Jews versus white Ashkenazic Jews? I, I, I missed the beginning, I'm sorry. Sorry, can you speak to the impact of performing whiteness has had on assimilation and loss of Sephardic culture and traditions for Sephardic Jews versus white Ashkenazic Jews? That is a big question. Um, and it is one that I'm very interested in. I think that the starting point to answer the question is to recognize that historically and legally, and then also in unconscious ways based on the system and structures that were in place in the United States, that becoming American or assimilating really means becoming white or becoming as close to being white as you can. And I think that that has had detrimental ramifications, both in terms of Ashkenazi Jewish experience in this country, the Sephardic Jewish experience in this country, and really many different kinds of experiences in this country, which by mostly insidious ways, by which I mean not, you know, I've had some discussions with some friends recently um, about a claim that I have tried to make that the United States in some ways coerced people to abandon their culture, immigrants, or forced people to abandon, like Ladino. How did Ladino disappear in this country? And um, I understand why people are reticent to accept that kind of framing of the thing, but it's it, what I would clarify there is that there was it was not forced in so far as somebody held a gun against your head and you said, speak English or I'm going to shoot you. Or it wasn't like in Turkey where there was a literal, a citizen, citizen speak Turkish campaign or in Greece, in both of these places you could be fined or punished literally if you spoke other languages than the national language. But here the system was such that it was very clear that there were rewards and privileges and rights that would be accrued to you if you did your best job to perform your white identity. Uh, that means dressing that way, and it means practicing your uh, religion in a civilized way according to uh, European or Western or American or Protestant standards, and it meant uh, speaking uh, English. American English, unaccented English. I'll never forget a conversation I had, somehow this popped into my head as I was thinking about this, a conversation with my nono, with my grandfather from Salonika, and this was maybe in the 90s. And he was talking about, I don't understand why Mexicans were still speaking Spanish. And uh, I said, well, you know, no, no, I mean, think about it. And the way that he thought about it was like, it was like a kind of a, a, a in, induction ritual, um, kind of like a way of uh, being, of entering into this club of what it means to be American, is that you speak English, the better unaccented English the best. And, and I, I said, I said, but no, no, but think about it. We, we were talking about this. We said, the same reason that maybe they want to speak Ladino is the re I mean, Spanish is maybe the reason that I would have, it would have been nice maybe if we, we couldn't have known, but, you know, to speak Ladino. And now Ladino is gone. Ladino is gone. And it was very interesting to see his response because you could see something like change in his thinking when he connected that experience to his own experience and the sense 
of yes, that was the that was what I had to do at that time to become American. But that was a very very high price, a very high price to pay, and that's what's involved in these kinds of trade offs. And I would recommend here another book by uh, by my colleague uh, Goldstein at uh, Emory University called The Price of Whiteness, which is about Jews and the bargain with becoming white and what had to be uh, given up in order to take advantage of the opportunities, privileges, and protections that came for, uh, that came with whiteness for those who were eligible. In other words, certainly if you were not black and if you were not brown. Uh, two last questions, and I think we'll, we'll probably call it for the night. Uh, do you think, uh, Miles asks, do you really need the term systemic racism? I hear that term used ordinarily in a very broad way for all kinds of behavior and social effects that may in some way be attributed to racial bias, whereas you have been talking about very clear and explicit racism expressed in laws and rulings. Okay, I think that, I think that that person, Miles, appreciated my specific definition. Is that what your understanding was? Uh, um, I think- that, that seems to be my understanding, at least. He was saying more of, I think, a nuance, what's the- Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think that that's right. I think we have to make some distinctions between different forms of racism or prejudice, because they are. Like, there are certain forms of bigotry that are really about interpersonal relations. Um, they may st stem or derive from some systemic, uh, legal, and institutionalized premise, but sometimes they might not, right? And I think that that is an important distinction to make, especially in our contemporary context. So, like, there are no laws right now that uh, I would say, do I want to say this? I think I'm going to say this. I, I do not believe that we should understand anti-Semitism in the United States as a form of systemic racism. I think that it exists in a variety of different domains in the country. It exists in government. It exists in uh, uh, political movements. It exists in social spaces. It exists in interpersonal dynamics. But Currently, we have protections in place generally so that um, you cannot be uh, denied a loan because you are Jewish, or you cannot not live somewhere because you are Jewish, or uh, there are a variety of these other kinds of things. If you go back earlier, um, you could not be denied the rights that came with the GI Bill because you were Jewish, whereas some of those rights were not available to Black people. Uh, so uh, there was a period in which Jews were part of the target of systemic racism in this way. And I would suggest that for white Jews, that no longer is the case. But I would caveat that by saying that anti-Semitism by no means has gone away at all. It is still a live uh, part of American society and world uh, politics, and it continues to take on uh, violent forms. Right? It may, what I like to say sometimes is that anti-Semitism may not be systemic in the United States, but it can be cataclysmic. Right? Think about Pittsburgh. Think about Poway. This is, these are examples of what I would consider cataclysmic uh, violence and anti-Semitism. A last question for now, and I'll, I'll be sure also, by the way, for those of you who we couldn't get to the questions this evening, I'll send those questions along to Dr. Nara, and hopefully we can maybe get, the, get some answers for you as well, and you can maybe even elaborate a bit more at the next, uh, next talk next week. Um, one last question. Can you talk maybe a little bit, this is a bigger question obviously, but maybe just a little bit, about Sephardic involvement in the slave trade and how earlier Sephardic Jews assimilated into the whiteness differently than the, like, those that came much later in like the 20th century, for example? I mean, I wonder, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about that next time, um, I would say, but I would just, the, the, the prologue as an answer to that question is that when the Levantine Jews began to arrive in the United States, the established Sephardic Jewish communities of Spanish and Portuguese background that had been in 
the United States since even colonial times. I'm talking about institutions like uh, especially Sheriff Israel. Their leadership insisted that these newcomers from the Ottoman Empire not be called Sephardic Jews. You can call them Levantine Jews. You can call them Oriental Jews. You can call them Ottoman Jews. You can call them Turkish Jews. But they should not be called Sephardic Jews because of the concern about how that might damage our own reputation and our own status as, I'm now speaking as like a, a representative of the Spanish and Portuguese uh, Jewish community, uh, to damage our own reputation and status as the grandees in the United States. So I think that that is one way to, uh, to begin to answer that question. Now that, that, that division will eventually be um, bridged you know, uh, I think the most powerfully represented by the fact of um, Rabbi Mark Angel of uh, Rodizli and, uh, and, uh, and Turquino heritage, Levantine Sephardic background, when he became the rabbi of Congregation Sheriff Israel in New York, in I guess that must have been the 60s or maybe early 70s, that uh, represented a, a, a very dramatic change and sort of the, the, the end of that differentiation between the uh, real Sephardic Jews and the Oriental or Levantine Jews. Dr. Nar, thank you so much for an amazing first lecture in our three-part series. Really wonderful. A lot of information, obviously, to take in. And we appreciate uh, it's still so many, so amazing, um, you know, so, <laughs> I have chats with different people that are saying we should have a new Sephardic TV channel. At this point, we have so many wonderful things to talk about. So um, I want to thank again, we have over 160 people still on. It's really amazing. Thank you all so much for sticking it out for, I know it's a long time, but we really do appreciate it. Uh, mashallah, we had over 250 people participating via Zoom and Facebook, which is wonderful. Um, I want to thank Dr. Nara again uh, for, and for helping us to initiate this three-part lecture. It's really wonderful, as well as the Isaac Ahad Foundation, who's generally supporting us in this, as well as our partners at Congregation Orva Shalom and the Seattle Sephardic Network. I just want to remind everybody, this is a part of the wider Sephardic Digital Academy initiative. We have so many other amazing programs as well on Ladino language. We actually have our dear instructor, Rochelle Amado Bortnik, a native of Izmir, here with us tonight, who's a wonderful teacher teaching uh, introductory of Ladino. We have amazing Sephardic history, Greek Jewish history, Roman history talks and lectures, uh, Torah and Halakha, Parasha of the week, insights into Sephardic customs and traditions, and so much more. And I want to encourage you all to please find out and check them out at SephardicBrother.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. And I'll mention one other thing that these programs, God willing, our hope is that we're trying to educate not only our community, but the wider Jewish world and the wider non-Jewish world about Sephardic identity, Sephardic heritage, our Sephardic community, and we can only do this with your support. And we ask that you, if you ever consider joining the Brotherhood, if you consider becoming a member, or if you consider even sponsoring another series or a lecture, we would gladly appreciate it. And it would help us to continue to further this mission of Sephardic education and culture. Um, I want to thank Dr. Nara again. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all, Sikhet al inshallah, God willing, next week. Thank you all so much. Thank you. No chara buena. Thank you all for sticking around. And please email me. I'm happy to continue. Ah, yes. We will, yeah, yeah. Please feel free to email Dr. Devanara. If you didn't find it in the chat, you can also just email us at info at Sephardic Brotherhood. We'll forward along your, your messages to him as well. Okay. Ethan, can you see the chat too, please? The Sorry? Chat. Yeah, yeah. I will also send you the chat, Devin. All right, good, great. Great. Muchas gracias. Al vermos. Al vermos. Thank you.